What's up, my man? Thank you, thank you. Thank What's you, up? thank you. You know, it was, it was, it's an honor to be honest with you. You know, I, I'm very, um, I've been a fan of your work for for quite some time. You know, I met your art through someone else that we're going to talk about later on because obviously you have a very strong connection to that person. Um, but also, after being able to visit you a few times and come here to your studio. And seeing the art, I thought to myself, man, we got we got to do a La Sala Talks with, with Figs because it's definitely something to talk about. Um, so just to jump right into it, tell me, like, how did this passion of art come upon you? Like, what led you to become an artist and why you picked the name Figs? All right. I mean, before, before I, I address that, first off, it's an honor for me to be speaking to La Sala Talks. I mean... Um, I've known about your work also. We know some of the same people. Um, so first off, I'm honored that you would take the time to interview me. Um, second off, I have this need and want to be heard by my community more. Yeah. Something that normally, that I don't always get to the, to the degree that, that I would like. Um, and giving me that outlet. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now going to the, the questions you asked me, um, you know, uh, I think I was born an artist. I think we're all artists in one way or another. I just want to get that out of the way real quick. Um, I didn't make myself an artist. One of the things, one of the distinctions I do bring up sometimes between that question or, or when that question is asked, I'm a working artist. I'm a teaching artist. You know what I mean? Um, you know, I've, I've been lucky enough, privileged enough, maybe good enough to exhibit my art at different places every once in a while. Um, so when I speak to a student or anybody, I always make the distinction, you know, in one way or another, we're all artists, you know. Mm. Um, now, whether you've actualized that, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, um, yeah. That can be something different. Um, I became an artist uh, again for like the last time in my life or the present iteration of me being an artist about 10 years ago. Um, I wasn't making art whatsoever. I'm a dropout of LaGuardia Music and Art, so I went to the best art high school in New York, but I dropped out of that school. And for a long time, up until about 10 years ago, um, I was just doing odd jobs. The, 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 the most that I ever did art was maybe doing a friend's album cover for his rap album or my ex-girlfriend's salsa instructional video cover, you know, something random every once in a blue. Um, but about 10 years ago, working with another local artist, really dope artist by the name of Dong Dong, um, I was working on his I Love My Hood project, helping him out, filling in characters and stuff like that. To make a long story short, and maybe we'll talk about it some more during this talk, but I found myself back into art and making art and then got lucky enough to start exhibiting art. So that's kind of how it happened in a nutshell. But where does that passion... Because, yeah, that's how you started professionally. Yeah. But as a child, when did that... You know, was it that first crayon? Like, what led to that passion, you know? Yeah, I think it was a mix. My mom is... um. My mom is an edu she's a retired educator, but she was an artist herself. Um, she wanted me to be an architect. I didn't have that in me, but she always was very um, very on top of giving me everything I needed in terms of a creative outlet. Um, I think to answer your question, probably the first thing was comic books. Mm. You know, comic books was a really big thing. Right after comic books. Pretty much at the same time with comic books, it's kind of a debate which one came first. But graffiti, moving to New York City. I moved to New York City in 1984. Between 1984 and 1986, because we were going back and forth from where I moved from. Um, but when I moved to New York in 1984 and saw this explosion of graffiti art and kind of pairing that with 
a love of comic books. Mm. Um, that's that's the original. That's that's where it all kind of like started to bubble to begin with. So tell me, where does the name Figs come about? Like, what was the idea? What is the story behind it? And it's funny that you say that because there is a story behind it. Um, 1986. So kind of the first official year I'm here in New York, I'm going to school on Stitt, um, 164th, um, Edgecombe Avenue. And I'm from 173rd. So 143, which we know about being from the hood, was um, overfilled. They weren't taking any more students from the 170s. It was over capacity. So I was one of those first, supposedly, from the history that I understand, I was one of those first years that they started... um, bringing kids outside of their community, which is still in Washington Heights. <laughs> but the 160s were different than the 170s. And yeah, look, yeah. it's going to make sense in a second why I'm giving this story. I used to write Zell, Z-E-L. Everybody had a tag. You know, like every, even if you didn't write that shit on walls, if you were alive in the 1980s, you had a tag. You know what I mean? Because graffiti was just so big. Yeah, yeah. And I wrote Zell. And I'm from 173rd between Fort Washington and Haven, which we used to call the light side because there was more white people. It was nicer, you know. And um, so I'm from 173rd and they sent me to school on 164th. And I find out pretty quickly that there's a Zell in the 160s. Now, if you're from Washington Heights, especially back in the 80s, the 160s were just rougher than the 170s. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, it was just raw. And for me and my little middle school mind, I was going to another borough, another city, another another hood, even though I was walking 10 blocks away. So, I, yo, I found out that this kid, another writer, was writing Zell. And very quickly, I made the decision that I had to change my tag because tradition would dictate that either two things would happen, at least on my block, you would fight over that name, and I didn't want none of that. I had just moved from San Diego <laughs> from a military base. I was very naive and like, nah. You'd either fight over that tag, or you'd come to some kind of compromise between both of y'all. And one of you would write Zell 1, the yeah. other one would write Zell 2. I didn't even want to go down that road of trying to like, you know, negotiate this shit. <laughs> so my boy, uh, Juan Pimentel, a dude that comes, he comes up again in why I make the kind of art I make. So if you want to go back to Juan Pimentel, it might be a good question. But Juan Pimentel goes, you know what you should write? You should write Fyro. Now, I looked up to Juan Pimentel. Juan Pimentel was only like a year older than me. It's not, you know, so what? He was like 13. You know what I'm saying? But for me, especially because I'm just moving here from California from a military base, like he was my New York City mentor. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, you know, and Juan Pimentel is like, you should write Fyro. So I'm like, word. <laughs> Fast forward years from that. And I'm like, wow, it sounds like a dog's name. You know what I mean? <laughs> but, you know, things stick. You know what I mean? Things yeah, yeah. stick to you. So I'm, I'm writing Fyro, F-I-R-O, Fyro 173. And little by little, that starts to morph. I'm known by two other tags. One of them is Feeks, which is kind of my, my art name now. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Feeks was the drug dealer on my block, um, Chino. And Chino used to be like, yo, Feeks, just because he was disrespectful in every way. So if your name was Edwin, he'd be like, Edwino. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. whatever. And whatever your name was, he'd change it. So Feeks comes from Chino on my block the drug dealer, and Figaro, which some people call me, come from another writer by the name of, um, I think he wrote um, Selk or something like that. But one day we were out riding, and he was bugging. He was making fun of my tag, Fyro, and he started um, singing Figaro, 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 and then next thing you know, that stuck. So (laughs) depending on what block I'm on or wherever I'm at, people might call me Figs, Fyro, or Figaro. So there's definitely a story behind that name. So talk to me about... Um, you know, I see some art up here, which is of interest not only to me, but I'm pretty sure to everyone who's watching. What's the story behind all of this and the connection to that specific person that I haven't mentioned by name, um, but that has great influence over you in certain pieces that are up here as well? Um, you know, some of the art that I have behind me, well, actually most of it, um, 
except for this one and that one, are all prints. Um, they're prints that originally were um, started in Pepe Coronado's studio. And I believe you are, yeah, I know for a fact, I don't believe it's not religion. Um, I know you, uh, you, you, you did an interview. <laughs> you see, that's going to have to be cut out. Um, you did an interview with Pepe Coronado, and um, I, I've, I've had the pleasure of working with Pepe for like the last about seven years now. Um, so this one, for instance, was a silk screen um, that Pepe had made me. Actually, um, Pepe had come up with the term ex-Latin, joking about one of my obsessions. So Pepe has worked on a lot of my prints, and a lot of my prints I kind of um, make fun of or try to focus or analyze um, the root word Latin and where it comes from. And we were sitting around one day, and he had brought up ex-Latin, not connecting it necessarily to the ex-men. Mm -hmm. And this idea, you know, going back, I was talking about comic books. So most people, even if you're not a fan of comic books, might recognize the iconic yeah. red and yellow lettering and normally would be X-Men. This one is X-Latin. Um, and what I did was I kind of uh, drew and made little throw-ups and burners and so on of different people in history that might fall under the categorization as Latin, but clearly are not Latin. <laughs> Actually, they were fighting against Latin domination, white supremacy. Um, so it's kind of like this trolling. I use the word troll a lot, not because I believe it's trolling, but because that's a catchword whenever any critical thought or dissent is brought up sometimes um, or unpopular. And what I mean by unpopular is it's not necessarily popular to attack the word Latino, Latina, Latinx, mm -hmm. or any of these words because they're words that we rally around. Um, but when I think about a Gaspar Yanga, you know, in Mexico, a black, you know, um, Mexican having to fight Latin people and thinking about him and, you know, like looking into the future, into the year 2020 and being like, wow, I'd be called Latin now. <laughs> Meanwhile, like they killed me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. so this piece is kind of about that. I mean, you know, Sebastian Lemba is somebody that all Dominicans should know. You know, you have a bunch of um, Ameridian Taino. Um, I can never pronounce half of the names right, so I'm not going <laughs> to. Um, um, but, you know, the Garifuna people, we all know who the Garifuna people is. Ramon Emetirio Bentances, Mamatingo, Desaline, um, Hatue, Toussaint Levratou, Franz Fanon. You know, it's just kind of playing around with these indigenous and clearly black um, Spanish or Romance language speaking people and kind of playing with the term Latin against it. But getting back to the original topic, these are all prints. Um, and I've been able to work with Pepe on print for the last seven years. Talk to me about this. Because I see, I, and I have something at my home that Pepe did, and it has it kind of similar in a way. Mm. Yeah, because this is Pepe's work in many ways. And what I mean by that is um, Pepe plays around. Uh, his, one of the, in his work a lot, you'll see, I, this isn't Pepe's name for it. It's kind of my name for it, kind of the repeating islands, mm -hmm. right? Um, the United States isn't an island how we would think about an island, but the way that these images kind of float around, and you'll see it in Pepe's work a lot. So Pepe, the way me and Pepe would collaborate besides just making prints together, meaning I might come up with a concept, and he works with lots of people in this way, not only me, but you might come up with the concept and he'll help you print it. That's one collaboration. These are different. These are us um, collaborating both creatively on a piece of art. So what he did was he provided me with the print that he made and I worked on top of that print. So this is pretty much just spray painted stencils of the island of um, Quisqueya or Hispaniola if you prefer um, with the outline of the United States. So we start off with Pepe's work and then I just add spray paint and color to it. So literally I'm like the colorist, Yo, you know? I wanna show you this actually, listen. 
looking at you guys record all of this stuff kind of gave me um gave me a rush of a project that i've been doing for like the last seven years or so i've been working with this artist in dominican republic by the name of um marie um Jimenez, yeah and this is a black book that went all around the dominican republic it went to puerto rico also um and new york it's all dominican artists so this one right here is Dr. Molecula, for instance. Dr. Molecula is like this old school graffiti artist from the Dominican Republic, from um, El Capital. Um, then you have Gabs right here, which is a younger um, Dominican graffiti artist, real big. Um, this one is by a... Argentinian Dominican dude, Atetualpa is his name, and he does these kind of um, stencil work throughout Dominican Republic. Then you have somebody like Kaz. Do y'all know who Kaz is? Kaz's work. So all of this is pretty much Dominican graffiti writers, you know? And it's a project that we started about seven years ago where we document, um, we did the same thing. We kind of did like these interviews on different graffiti artists. That's Freco the crew, right there. This is Freco. Um, SK crew, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Look, fine. Um, El Marciano, que se llama El Marciano? What does he write? He calls himself a Martian, yo. Um, Freco's friend. I forgot his name right now. This is Kron. Kron is a tattoo artist in our hood, really dope artist in general. Actually, he lives like a block away. The point is, I wanted to show you this book because it's really dope. It's all these Dominican graffiti writers from Dominican Republic, some from here, and so on. Going back to some of my other work, um, and in the vein of printmaking, which kind of are all mixed media prints, this one right here is. Um, called Confederate Dominicans. Um, it's called Confederate Dominicans, Dominicans celebrating the 1844 independence reminds me of Southerners romanticizing the Confederacy. It's kind of a long title because I kind of um, like over explaining things. And it's a mix of the Confederate United States flag and the Dominican flag. I made it in 2012 at about the same time that they were passing um, 168.13, which is um, the law that um, took away um, citizenship from supposedly foreign born, but we know that it was Haitian, um, Dominicans of Haitian descent. And there's little things like San Pedro. My mother's not from San Pedro, but she lives in San Pedro. So it's the place that I mostly go to when I go to the Dominican Republic. Um, De Saline, Africa, which, you know, most of us know by now that we do have roots in. Um, so yeah, it's just kind of messing around with the flag and making a critique um, on it. I almost got smacked for that flag in the Dominican Republic. Um, if I can talk about this one, this one is um, called Fuck the Enye. Um, the Enye with the accent over it. And it's kind of, um, you know, it comes out of my adolescence. And what I mean by that is struggling with Spanish. I've always kind of had this, um, this anxiety and resentment towards Spanish in general because I was never fluent in it. Um, and I was made fun of it. So I called this one Fuck the Enye. And it's a play on the different identities that were fed to me throughout time. So I'm a 44 year old man. When I was younger and I first got to New York, I remember the big thing was everybody used to be like, I'm Spanish. You could be Ecuadorian, you could be Dominican, you could be Puerto Rican. Yo, you Spanish? Yeah, I'm Spanish, right? And, um, you know, kind of like, I don't need to explain why calling yourself a language doesn't make sense, right? So I'm gonna skip that part. And then the next popular term was Hispanic. Um, and it became very popular kind of in political circles in New York City in particular um, and in things like the Hispanic Society, the Hispanic Federation, all of these places made it very very popular 
The problem is Hispanic just means pertaining to Spain. Um, so it's pretty much the same problem. It's putting ourselves um, through the lens of our conquerors, right? Um, viewing ourselves through Colonia. And Hispanic made way for Latino and Latino or Latinx or whatever Latin America is kind of um, what we ended up with after Hispanic. But to me, it never really made sense. And I will tell you why. The reason why is uh, we got away from Hispanic because we didn't want to be called a language. We didn't want to be called something that referred to a subjugation of us. So we switched to Latino, but what's the difference? <laughs> what's the difference? We're saying that we're more diverse than just being the result of Spanish conquest? No, we are the result of an orgy of European conquest, as if that's better? As if that changes the narrative at all? I say it doesn't, right? So that's what this piece is literally talking about. It's going from Spanish to Hispanic to Latino to what I prefer, which is Caribeño. And if you notice, it doesn't have the accent over it, right? I'm kind of paying homage to my Spanglish roots. And when I say my Spanglish roots, like I'm talking about the way that I spoke growing up and all of that and and um, what's near and dear to my heart. So Caribbean is a geography, right? It's not a language. Um, when you say the word Latino, there's connotations also to religion, specifically Catholicism, when you're thinking about the Latin world. And these are things that I reject overall. When you mention the word Caribbean, it could be a Jamaican that speaks English. It could be a Dominican that speaks Spanish. But guess what? We all speak, we all have African beats in our music. We all eat platanos. We all eat some form of rice and beans, right? So I rather connect through those things than just the languages that were forced on us. And that's kind of what this piece is talking about at the end of the day. Um, if I can jump to another, I'm really proud of this one. I need to kind of do it over again. But these are my cutting notices from LaGuardia Music and Art. <laughs> I cut a lot of art classes. This is called the Jewish Zombie. I did this back for my first group exhibition for El Museo del Barrio, it was called The S-Files in 2011. And it reads, I hate being told my salvation comes through the Jewish zombie. Some people don't get it, some people get it automatically. I'm talking about Jesus and the fact that if you tell me that if I don't believe in Jesus, I'm going to burn in eternal hell is something that's very hurtful <laughs> and this is what the piece is about it's about monotheism and about not necessarily wanting to adhere to that one and only way of um, thinking about the world or thinking about ethics or morality or anything like that this one was shown at studio museum of Harlem. also something i'm very very proud of um then this one, I would love to talk to you about really quick. This one is near and dear to my heart also. It's kind of faded. I didn't make this one in a good way, so it's fading a lot. But it's, it's little drawings about things that encompass my identity. Now talk to me about this. Uh, it seems like a parking sign that you just happened to take. And... <laughs> yeah, a lot of my original work started off with this, actually, um, which is kind of a longer story. But when I first started making um, pieces, you know, I'm not trying to sound like I was mega poor. It's not like I was living in poverty necessarily, but I didn't have art supplies. Mm. I mean, I had markers and stuff like that. I didn't have canvases or anything like that. And I was given the opportunity, the curators at El Museo del Barrio was like, yo, can we come see your work? And literally it was based off of a conversation. Um, I got really happy. I kind of knew what the opportunity was, but at the same time, I only had like books with art in it, pen and ink books, you know? And I didn't think that's what they wanted to see. I thought they wanted to see objects. They wanted to see canvases, things, you know what I mean? 
So what I did was I manufactured a lot of work. I was like, you know what? I'm going to make work in the next two weeks, yo. I took ideas that float around my head normally that have to do with religion, graffiti, hip-hop, sex sometimes. And I used my the materials I had around. I'm a bit of a hoarder. And I had these street signs in my apartment. I never took one off of an actual sign. Never have I done that. But if you walk around New York, you'll see them like laying on the floor sometimes. Um, Maybe on the pole, on the floor, Mm. and then I'll take it off or whatever. (laughs) It's on the floor already. So what I did was I started making work on a lot of these street signs at first. They were my canvases. And the idea behind it was, A, a free material, but B, it was a critique on graffiti in institutions. Mm. You know, there's a lot of people that would pose the question, does graffiti belong in an institution? Does it take away the feeling or the act of what graffiti should really be? Which, for some people, um, should be an act of appropriation, appropriating, you know, space in public. Some people might call it vandalizing, you know. So what I did was I did um, work on these signs, which technically is a felony offense. Nobody's out here looking for people with the signs. I mean, it's not that big of a deal, but technically it is a felony offense. So what I did was I did it on these public property or government property, depending on how you want to look at it. And gave it to the museum and was like, put it up. It's not the first time a graffiti artist did a piece of art on a street sign. I don't know if they thought about what I was thinking about in the back because it was like this fail safe because I was criticizing myself about putting graffiti, being a real graffiti artist and then going into a gallery. So I was like, wouldn't it be cool if they were committing a crime with me? Mm. Right. Technically, this is a crime. Put it up in your house. Now you committed a crime also. You know what I'm saying? And that was kind of the idea behind the street signs. But if you want to know a little bit more about it, this is, you know, kind of... I I love talking about identity through geography more so than religion or language. Um, So I, I, I prefer Caribbean. And this is the Caribbean with the names of the islands pretty much where they would be in the water um that's simply what that one is and it's kind of a back and forth piece with a familiar motto that i always yeah so talk to me about that spray can right behind you ah this one is that good there so (laughs) this one right here is um this one is, is also, I do a lot of series of work. Like I, I refer to Pepe's work where you'll see like the islands over and over again. I have a lot of work that might look similar or, or continues with the same theme like a lot of artists do. This one in particular is, is Fuck Brushes. The original was called Fuck Brushes. This one is called Religion 2. The original was called Fuck Brushes because of two reasons. It was a play on words in a way. I was attacking brushes because I was forced to go to LaGuardia Music and Art by my mother. I wanted to go to art and design high school, which was much more of a, wow, the wind's hard, yo, Um, much more of a drafting, cartooning school. Um, But my mother made me go to a painting, traditional, you know, um, um, alte platico type school, you know. And I created this dislike for art going to that school. I didn't like oil paints. It was too messy. I didn't like learning about European painters and shit like that. So for me, brushes is something that literally I didn't like. They were messy, you know, paints messy. Um, I literally don't like working with brushes. But I'm not only talking about actual brushes. I'm talking about brushes standing in for traditions, dogmas, um, religion. You know, it can be anything. But the way the way you know the way that we 
because we want to respect our ancestors, we sometimes think we can't do things different from our mm-hmm. ancestors or our ancestors were never wrong. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah. And this is kind of attacking that. It's a piece saying fuck brushes also. It's on Leviticus paper, something we can all find beef with. Um, and it's talking about fuck, fuck tradition. You know what I mean? Like, that's, that's pretty much the gist of it. Entonces, háblame del bulto. Ah. Y no es que tú estás haciendo bulto. I want to know why the word bulto is on this book. You know, bulto... Um, First of all, what book is this? Yeah, this is a book my mom gave me. Um, my mom gave me a bunch of Dominican books. This one is El Crito de la Libertad. And it's by um, Joaquín Balaguer. El Vida del Juan Pablo Duarte. My mother gave it to me. I ain't gonna lie. I've attempted to read it. I only understand about 70% of stuff I read in Spanish. I, I, you know, it's something I, um, I struggle with big time, the language. Um, but I know enough about Juan Pablo Duarte, and I know enough about Joaquin Balaguer um, to put bulto on this book. Um, you know, bulto, for most people, is lies, right? You know, growing up in Washington Heights, you know, tu eres bultero, bulto, you know, it's pretty much saying liar, you know, or um, whatever. It's fake. It's exactly not fake. real. Exactly. So this man, you know, you know, I'm not here to give a history lesson, but Joaquin Balaguer, you know, they called him the brain of fucking Trujillo. Mm-hmm. You know, he wasn't innocent, you know. Um, Noam Chomsky claimed he killed more people um or assassinated more political um, opponents than even Trujillo did. It's just he did it in a much smarter way, and he didn't go around raping all the women he meant, right? So I'm not religious at all. I actually find a lot of beef with religion. Um, But, you know, 90% of what Jesus said, whether he was real or not, I don't know. Pretty cool dude. You know what I'm saying? Like, pretty cool dude for the most part. Except for the mountaintop stuff and whatever, you know, communist, hippie, wanted to give everybody food, hung out with prostitutes, I mean, sex workers and thieves and all this. And for, you know, him to write a book, El Crito de la Libertad, and attaching this, like, revolutionary figure to, like, somebody like Duarte and, and, you know, I thought Duarte was the worst. I just wanted the cobulto on it, you know what I mean? Like... And it was just using the book also as an artifact. You know what I'm saying? Apart from that. So it really came down to when I wanted to use the book as a found object, as an object to make art on, it literally was like, what do I write on it? I'm not going to write my tag. You know, that's kind of too, like, too graffiti. You know what I'm saying? So lies, you know, and that's literally what I wrote on it. It's become, it's become... It's become a well-liked piece amongst people that know our history. All right. So, because of that last explanation that you give me upon your work, I want to ask you this. Do you consider your art to be very political? Um, And what we would call in Spanish, arte de resistencia, where you're always challenging the traditional narrative through your art. And if so, why? What is this need that you have to speak to it? Because some people, through ex- self, you know, inflicted wounds or maybe experience through the many things that systemically hurt us, yeah. um, and others just because they read it in the history book and they came upon it and they're like, you know, this shit is wrong. I have to do something about it. Let me do it through my means, through what I could do. Because not everyone has to be an organizer and everyone has to go out and get elected to an office and try to, you know, create a revolution. You could do it through your art. Mm-hmm. So I ask you, is that the purpose of your art and why? I mean, yeah, it definitely is the purpose. I think it's the purpose of every artist, though. It's just how we choose to do it and what we choose, what we see, what we feel like we need to fight against. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Um, but there, like, there is art, and I don't know if you agree with this, that doesn't challenge the narrative it feeds into it there's art that feeds into homophobia there's art that feeds into xenophobia there's art that feeds into um, 
you know, this toxic masculinity and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, but then there's this other art that challenges it. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I, 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 yes, I definitely do that. And I think anybody that knows my work thinks that I do that to the point of trying specifically to be um, contradictor, you know, contradictory or, um, you know, uh, brash about it. Yeah, it's you know definitely I mean? unapologetic, that's for sure. I mean, yeah, I am unapologetic about it, but everything I make art about comes from my heart, and it's something that that um, that that I feel very passionately about. I think one of the differences is that yes, I make art against you know the 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 the, the forces that be, but sometimes I'm much more interested in having a conversation within my own culture. Meaning. Meaning, this book is about Dominican history. Okay. You know, I'd rather talk about white supremacy in the Dominican Republic than talk about white supremacy in the United States. There's enough of us doing that. It definitely exists. I'm definitely down to fight it. But in my art in particular, you know what I'm saying? i rather, like, talk about my little, you know, neck of the woods. Um, so, for instance, some people might use the word Latino, Latina, Latinx, and they'll think they're fighting the status quo. We're showing the United States. You know what I'm saying? We're here. We're proud. We're loud. Then you have some people like me and some other people that are like, actually, you're calling yourself a white supremacist word to begin with, and we need to look at this. And then they'll look at me and be like, ah, well, you know, you're being, you're just trying to, like, be contradictory. I'm, you know what I'm saying? So, in one way... I feel like I'm, you know, standing up for the things I believe in. But a lot of people don't think that. They think I'm just trying to, like, start an argument or something or, or be a troll. You know? well, no, Does but, that make sense? Yeah, the, I mean, when you, when you challenge any narrative, you, you're, you're inviting to a conversation. You're mm -hmm. inviting a dialogue to come forth. Um, having said that, I want to ask you the following because it seems that and I say this because one of the reasons that I came here today is, be, and you stated something, you know, you alluded to that earlier. We don't celebrate as much our local artists unless they make it into one of these um, mainstream media platforms and they get acceptance from the very thing that we criticize and we want to fight. Mm -hmm. So do you feel that the local art is being highly contested to the point that it might just be gone um, because there's a lot of forces coming in. Yeah, we have gentrification. Yeah, we have people who, even if they're not gentrifying, but they weren't really raised or born in this community and they just moved here two or three or four years ago. So they don't understand the dynamics or the worth of the people that were here before mm -hmm. and done the work in many, you know, many respects, not just in art, whether it's an educator, whether it's an organizer or so forth. Uh, but in this specific realm in art, do you feel that the local art is being highly contested to the point that it might disappear uh, because everything's being commercialized and just pushed out? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is we hardly have any art spaces uptown to begin with. I mean, um, I told you before, I, you know, I re-entered art by hanging around Distra and his project that he had um, during the earlier 2000s. You know, first off, you know, that, that it's a long conversation. Graffiti, graffiti has, you know, I, I know you're talking about art in general, but, you know, I think about graffiti, and graffiti has a very, very long history in this neighborhood in particular. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, a very long history. Matter of fact, one of the first histories predating the Bronx, if you want to listen to somebody like Future 2000. Um, and we've lost that because of a lot of different factors, you know what I'm saying? And there's lots of different factors. I mean, you know, if I want to be fair, I can say, okay, well, we're not necessarily an industrial zone, 
where you go to Brooklyn and you go to Queens and you have a lot more patches of places like that mm -hmm. where it's more suitable to put up a big mural yeah, yeah, yeah. or whatever. You know, that's being fair. But then the other part of it is, you know, like literally I remember, you know, going with Dister to Bodegas and asking for the wall outside and the or bodega the, owner... The gate, you know. Yeah, asking gate. how much are we going to pay him to paint on his gate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then Dister might <clears throat> explain something like, no, 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 it's going to be I Love My Hood. There's going to be kids playing basketball and, you know, positive. It ain't even going to be my own name. You know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah. something positive. Oh, no, 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 no. But Can you ride Diaz grocery for free? Now, now you want art for free. And then a lot of the other times it would be something like, pero eso ilegal? It would be like, no, pero esa es razón que te estamos preguntando. So that it won't be illegal. No, pero eso latas son ilegal. No, 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 no. I'm all, see, what I'm trying to explain to you is like the, 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 the cons what people would think about when they would think about public art or graffiti, right? And that was on the neighborhood level. And then we can talk about it on an institutional level, right? First off, there ain't a whole lot of institutions uptown in our neighborhood in particular. There's a lot in Harlem, our neighbor, right? There's a lot in East Harlem that I work in also. Um, but we have even less here. No Mahad studio space. I mean, um, exhibiting space, what, about five years ago? But now they don't have any space. Um, I've worked with Noma a lot specifically, and they've done some great things. There's also been some situations where some of the leadership in our neighborhood have picked people that don't even live in the neighborhood um, for big commissions. Mm. Which, by the way, I want to mention. I got you know one of my biggest commissions that I got recently was through Noma, um, and my name was 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 put up for consideration. So I want to give thanks to them. I don't want to only talk crap about our institutions. But at the same time, the truth of the matter is, if you go through you know, the subway tunnel on 191st, for instance, the one train, you know, none of those artists are Washington Heights artists. That was a big commission. I think one of them are. I'm not sure, though. Um, and then even when you're talking about that, I find a lot of the times it's our newer residents meaning we're talking a lot about gentrification. Who's getting these opportunities? Are they artists that have been working in these communities for decades and trying to get these opportunities? Or is it a brand new resident that might come in, like my wife, with her Sarah Lawrence degree and whatever, you know what I mean? And we look at that and we exoticize that and we wanna like show that we're open or whatever. And you know, a lot of the times I see them people getting the opportunities while we're running around begging for them, you know? So, you know, I think, I think the state of art in our neighborhood is something that we really, really need to keep working at. We don't have a lot of space for it and, um, and funding for it, yeah. All right. Well, uh, thank you. It was a pleasure talking to you, man. <laughs> We're going to continue to honor your work and celebrate it because you definitely need to be celebrated for your part in trying to keep the arts alive.